Okay, carrying on. So we've got our directional terminology. We have cranial refers to towards the head. Caudal refers to towards the tail. Dorsal, we picture a dorsal fin, so along the back or the spine of the animal. Ventral is the opposite, and it's along the belly. If we're talking about the head specifically, we use caudal towards the tail, rostral towards the nose. Looking at the body of the animal, we use medial, which is towards that belly button line, or lateral towards the side, so the sort of the side ribs of the animal or the side of the abdomen. When we're looking at the feet, we have a couple ways to um, identify areas on the foot. So when we're talking about the hind feet, the top portion of the foot is called the dorsal aspect, again referring to the back of the animal. And specifically when we're talking about the feet, the bottom of the feet, so where the pads are on the back feet, are called the plantar portion. And on the front foot, dorsal again for the top part, and palmer. So think about the palms of your hands refers to the front feet, the bottom aspect of the front feet. And then we have, when we're talking about legs and appendages, such as the tail, we can use the terms proximal, which means close to the body. Distal means away from the body. Okay, so looking at this dog, this is above his elbow, pretending that his elbow is here, so it's proximal aspect of the limb, it's more towards the body. Distal, it's away from the body. And this dog is missing something. Pew, missing leg. Okay, when we think about animals, we have to think about them as their own beings. Okay, they don't take on our qualities. Whereas if we were to look at a chair, the left side of the chair is our left side. Okay, and again, I can explain it in class. So animals have their own unique qualities. So when we're looking at this cat, is that ear the left or the right ear? You have to switch it around and have yourself facing the same way the cat's facing, and that's his right ear. Again, with this cat, this is my cat helping me mark. Looks like cytology papers, and I drew on him with a highlighter. Uh, that's his left ear. Okay, so again, we're switching it up. He has his own unique qualities. That's his left ear. His name is Moose. And this was my, my little rat, Ringo, which I'll just let you know, all the animals, or sorry, all the pocket pets, so the rodents, the right, the rice, the mice, the rats, um, the rabbits, they are all up for adoption, and rats and mice make fabulous pets. So this was my little rat, Ringo, that I adopted from Seneca. Looking at that paw, that's his left paw bones. So let's get into bones. Functions of bones. You can go through Colville, page 154 to 155 to follow along. First function is to support. So they support spinal processes and support the cranium. Number two is protection. The ribs protect the lungs and the heart. Number three is leverage. They're attached to muscles. So each process on the bone, as we look at bones, bones aren't perfectly square, perfectly round, perfectly rectangular. They have all these 3D characteristics to them. And all those projections, so those pointy parts, those uh, edges that stick out, those are called processes. And they attach to, um, to muscles and allow us to run and jump and walk, and animals too. So that's the purpose of all those processes. Storage. They store calcium. Uh, they store marrow to make new bone and also connective tissue, and blood cell formation. So very specifically, the marrow, uh, the red marrow is used in blood cell formation. So you'll find red marrow in the long bones of animals, and we'll talk about the long bone anatomy in a little bit. And the red marrow specifically creates new blood cells. So definitely know the functions of the bones. Now going back, these are just examples of support. Okay, that's not the only example for each of these bone functions. They're just examples. Types of bones. So the types of bones, we have flat bones, short bones, irregular bones, long bones, and other, sort of a miscellaneous category. 
Flat bones, we have lots of flat bones throughout the body. A lot of the bones within the skull are flat bones. Okay, a lot of them have, uh, the bones within the skull have fused over time. So they actually have little tiny seams, little tiny joints within the bones. But those are flat bones in the cranium portion of the skull. And this bone here is a scapula, also known as a shoulder blade. So the shoulder blade is also considered a flat bone. Short bones. Short bones are interesting little bones. They typically assist with mobility. So we have a carpus and a tarsus here. Of uh, This is definitely equine. So the little tiny bones within the carpus and the tarsus, they're sort of marshmallow shaped, sort of soft squares almost, or little cuboidal bones. Those are considered short bones, and we have tons of short bones in our carpus and our tarsus. Now the carpus is the wrist, so that joint. The carpus refers to the wrist joint, and the tarsus refers to the ankle joint. There's a good way, a couple ways that you can keep them in your head to separate them, which one's which. Carpus, I think of driving a car, you use your hands, uh, so carpus refers to wrist. And the tarsus, you get your foot stuck in tar. So there you go, your foot would be your tarsus, which is your ankle, and your hands, driving a car, are your carpus, and your wrist. Our irregular bones are interesting. We have lots of different irregular bones, and they include a type of bone called sesamoid bones. So these little sesamoid bones were named because they actually look, they take on the shape of a sesame seed. They're a lot bigger. Your patella, so your kneecap, is a big sesamoid bone, and your flabella, behind your knee, you have little sesamoid bones. Um, generally, they sit over, uh, they, they're found where a tendon passes over a joint. So the purpose of these little guys, the patellar pe tendon would be attached to the femur, sits over the patella to keep the patella in place, and then attaches to the tibia. So that tendon or ligament, um, if the patella, or sorry, if, yeah, if the patella wasn't there, it would get flattened and stuck to that joint itself. Okay, so the sesamoid bones sit over the joint to prevent the tendon from flat sorry, prevent the tendon from flattening and sticking to that joint. And you'll see these little bones too, these sesamoid bones in horses' hooves. Um, we'll get into those after, but they have the navicular bone, which is a sesamoid bone. Another example of an irregular bone are the spinal processes. So your vertebrae, and they just have an irregular shape, and we'll talk about their anatomy shortly. And again, these are all just examples of irregular and the different types of bones. Long bones, a couple of examples. You have uh, radius here, and you have your femur, okay, likewise with your tibia. And then other, sort of the miscellaneous category. If anybody can identify what type of bone this is, I will try to remember and bring a prize to class. It'll be in your textbook. <laughs> Okay, so our structure of the long bone, we've got lots to talk about with this one. So the long bones would be your tibia, uh, your femur, your humerus, and radius as well. The biggest long bone in your body and in the animal's body is, of course, the femur. So that's, um, well, it's, that's just what it is. <laughs> so looking at our long bone, we have the epiphysis at the top. And at the bottom, so epiphysis refers to the distal and proximal portion of the bone. Diaphysis is the shank of the bone. The periosteum is the hard coating on the bone. So the periosteum contains bone-forming cells, which are really important for fracture healing. So the outer surface of the periosteum is the hardest surface. And the inner surface of the periosteum is what contains those bone-forming cells. So if you get a fracture, it's really important that the inner layer of your periosteum gets to work and starts creating more bone cells. Um, the periosteum, it covers the whole bone in general, except for the articular surface of the bone. And the articular surface, when we talk about that, it means the joint portion of the bone. So this portion would meet with other bones or one other bone to form a joint, and you won't find periosteum 
on that area. The epiph epiphyseal plate, again, epiphysis refers to either the proximal or distal end of the bone. So we have these epiphyseal plates, which are also called growth plates. And in young animals, they continue to lengthen the bone. So the bone grows through the epiphyseal plate, starts off as cartilage, and slowly becomes bone over time. It's very difficult on young animals, so puppies, kittens, um, young horses and cows, to identify whether or not, uh, sorry, <laughs> whether or not uh, an animal has broken its limb if it's not overly obvious, because these epiphyseal plates, these growth plates, can get quite confusing, and they can actually look like a fracture without being one. So the spongy bone, the stuff up at the top, it's at the top and at the bottom. We just have it covered by the periosteum here. The spongy bone is also called cancellous bone, and it's made up of tiny little bone spicules. So it's like a big game of pickup sticks, tiny little crisscross bone spikes. Um, the spaces between these little spicules or spikes are filled with red marrow, and the red marrow is that marrow that creates new blood cells. The little... Um, sort of porous spicules, the formation of the cancellous bones, it helps reduce the weight of the bone without impeding function of the bone. So it just breaks it up a little bit and it's a little bit porous within that area. The endosteum is the hollow, uh, the lining of the hollow part of the bone on the inside. Our yellow marrow is within that core, it's within that hollow area of the bone. And the yellow marrow is responsible, it's mostly made up of adipose tissue, which is fat, and it creates connective tissue. So yellow marrow is fat and connective tissue. Red marrow is formation of new blood cells. So it's good to know this. <laughs> All right, so let's talk about our axial versus appendicular skeleton. This picture identifies it nicely. So our appendic oh that the, the spelling error there should be two p's there. Our appendicular skeleton refers to appendages. So think of it like that appendicular appendages, whereas our axial skeleton is the main frame, sort of the axis of the skeleton. So looking at this, our appendicular skeleton is pink, and our axial is bone white. A good way to remember it, uh, to remember all the bones that are within the skeleton in general and how they belong to the axial skeleton in particular. Very small murderers have really small axes. So within the axial skeleton, you have the vertebrae, spinal processes, which are more or less the same thing we're talking about, the mandible, hyoid bone, ribs, sternum, and axial skeleton. So it's just a little way to remember it. Um, vertebrae, we're talking about our spinal processes. It's the same thing. So vertebrae and spinal processes, mandible, hyoid, hyoid bone, sorry, ribs, sternum, that is the axial skeleton. Again, that should be double P for appendicular, likewise there. Okay, so appendicular are the bones of the appendages. So, sorry, that sort of skipped a little bit. Let's go back and we'll look at the axial skeleton. So starting with the head, we have different ways of defining what type of face a dog or a cat has. So we have brachycephalic, mesatocephalic, and dolichocephalic. So your brachycephalics, most of you will recognize as the pugs, as any animal that ha has a smushy face. So, so common breeds would be Pekingese, Shih Tzu, Pug, for sure. Mesatocephalic are dogs with a moderate sized snout. So a lab is your typical mesatocephalic. And dolichocephalic are dogs with really long snouts. So I think of greyhounds and collies with those needle nose snouts. In this case, what type of faces do we have here? Okay, so the skull, we're carrying on to talk about the skull. 
Our skull and the animal skull is mainly made up of flat bones. It contains, its two portions would be the cranium and the lower, lower jaw, so the two dentary bones. Cranium, of course, protects the brain, the eyes, the ears, and the maxilla and mandible together function to provide attachment for muscles that allow mastication. So I'll see if we... So this would be considered the cranium. You have your mandible, which is the upper part of the jaw. Or, sorry, your ma um, maxilla is the upper part of the jaw. And I'm sorry, I would stop and go back and just correct myself, but when I stop the recording, it erases it. <laughs> so your cranium is the overall portion of the skull, the upper portion of the skull. And then we can break it down. We have your maxilla, which is the upper portion that holds attachment for the teeth. And your mandible is your jawbone that moves during mastication. The external bones of the skull, don't worry about all of them, but we will talk about quite a few of them. So it's the ones I highlight that we want to know for sure. So points of interest on the skull. This is a good picture that you should definitely keep and know. So we have our incisive bone, which is at the very front of the skull. And if you think about it, those your smiling teeth, so those teeth right at the front of your mouth are called your incisors, hence the incisive bone. Number six is our nasal bone. And on most of our feline models, the nasal bone will be gone. Um, and on some of the canine models as well, it's a very thin, very fragile little bone. Within the nasal bone is contained the turbinates. So if you go to page 169 in Colville, you'll see a picture of the turbinates, and those are four scroll-like bones within the nose, within the nasal cavity. Purpose of the turbinates is as the air comes in through the nose, it has to go through the various scrolls before it goes into the lungs. Those scrolls are covered with nice, moist, vascular tissue, so that tissue allows uh, to humidify and to warm the air coming in before it hits the lungs. Next we move on to the maxilla, so again that's the upper portion of the jaw, the maxilla. Your lacrimal bone is this tiny little one here, and what I want you to know about the lacrimal bone is that it sits just within the eye socket, so the rostral aspect of the eye socket, and it contains the lacrimal ducts, and the lacrimal ducts are tear ducts. Zygomatic, um, the zygomatic arch here, that is, we'll talk about that in class too, it's sort of the cheekbone of dogs and cats, and it's really important, we use it a lot in cats when we have to look inside their mouth, or when we have to give them a pill, then we'll definitely use that zygomatic arch to actually physically open their mouth. Frontal bone is one of two places where the sinuses are held. Okay, so we have frontal sinuses here, and it goes all the way up to the top of the cranium. So uh, clinical application for this one, a couple things. If an animal has a fracture on their head, so in their skull, and it affects the frontal bone, and I've seen this before, then what can actually happen is as that animal is breathing in and out, the sinuses are open, and your sinuses are little air passageways within your skull. The sinuses are open, and their, their scalp will inflate and deflate, and inflate and deflate. Likewise, cattle have uh, their horns. Their horns are growing out of their frontal bones. So when a calf or a, a cow or bull is dehorned and the frontal sinus is opened up, in the winter you can actually see them steaming out of their head because their frontal sinuses are opened up. So as they breathe out, it hits the air and steams up. It's just kind of interesting. Number eight is the parietal bone, so that's at the caudal aspect of the skull. Number nine is quite small, it's the interparietal. Eleven is the occipital bone, which is quite important because it has these two little points on it on either side called the occipital condyles. And the occipital condyles are what attach to and create the joint connecting the spinal cord to the skull. Number ten has the temporal bone. And the most important part about the temporal bone is this little guy here, and that is called the tympanic bulla. The tympanic bulla is a little sack of bone. It's a hollow little area of bone 
has a little door on it, so a little opening. And the purpose of the tympanic bulla is to house and protect the internal ear structures. So within the tympanic bulla, um, across this little door, is co it's covered by the tympanic membrane, so the eardrum. And then within that would be your bones and little organelles of the ear. Number four is the sphenoid bone. We won't talk too much about that. And this is number 12, the mandible. So that's really important. And again, see these processes. So those areas that stick out on the animal, including the zygomatic arch, the tip of the mandible, the tip here, those are all connected to bones, or no, to bones, to muscles. So those are all acting as attachment for muscles. And this one in particular within the mandible, it's muscles to allow for mastication. Uh, the mandible itself is divided into a left and a right side, and it's divided by the little mandibular symphysis, is what it's called, and it's a little tiny cartilaginous joint. So um, clinical application for that. You often see it with, I find cats most often, who have been hit by a car. Sometimes their jaw will look physically crooked, and it is because their mandibular symphysis, that little cartilaginous joint, has become dislocated and one side of the jaw is hanging lower than the other. Okay, so we talked about this on the other slide. So you have your occipital bone at the back here and it carries on through to the occipital condyles, uh, which actually I apologize, those arrows should be here, those are your occipital condyles. Uh, oh no, it continues, ignore me. Sorry, those are your occipital condyles in general. It's two projections within the skull on either side. And the occipital condyles, really important for attachment to the first portion of the spine. Your tympanic bulla, those are those bulbous little areas that house the internal ear organs. And your foramen magnum, is your opening. So if you think about it, what would be coming out of the skull and into the spinal cord? <laughs> and into the spine. It'd be the spinal cord. So your foramen magnum is where the spinal cord comes out and attaches to be protect to the, protected by the spine. A couple clinical applications with the foramen magnum. Uh, there's a couple diseases that animals can get that cause their brain to be bigger than their skull itself. Happens very often in King Charles Spaniels. So they have a giant brain and a tiny little cranium. So what happens is that the brain actually physically gets pushed and starts getting pushed back into this form and magnum and it inevitably compresses against the spinal cord and they go neurological. Um, it's called, where are we at? Chiari-like malformation is the, the technical name for that. It's also called syringomyelia, sorry, syringomyelia, commonly known as scratcher's syndrome because the animals will constantly be scratching the air behind their neck trying to get rid of the irritation that is the crowding of their brain out into their spine. So this is a practice activity you can do to learn the portions of the skull. So in between our skull and the start of the rest of our body on the ventral aspect is the hyoid bone. So have a look in Colville, page 169, and read the paragraph on the hyoid bone. Know its approximate location and its function. Spinal processes. Here's our equations. Carnivore, C7, T13, L7, S3, CD5-20. Equine, C7, T18, L5-6, S5, CD, 15-21. Bovine, C7, T13, L5, S5, CD, 16-18. What the heck does this mean? This is the number of each type of spinal process that these animals have. And we'll go through each. So carnivores, dogs and cats, you'll need to know that they have seven uh, cervical spinal processes. I'll change that in your notes. It should be cervical, not cranial. They have 13 thoracic, seven lumbar, three sacral, and five to 20 caudal or coccygeal. Those two terms are used interchangeably, and it carries on. 
So what that actually means is that looking at our carnivores, our cervical vertebrae, don't call it cranial, that was a mistype. So our cervical vertebrae, we have seven. And they're labeled from cranial to caudal. Okay, so looking at our cervical vertebrae, we have C1, C2, C3, C4, C5, C6, and C7 starts to get hidden by the scapula, which should be superimposed over that uh, thoracic process. Okay, so then thoracic vertebrae, uh, you can't really count them because <laughs> the model's not great, but they have 13 thoracic vertebrae. Lumbar, they would have seven, with the final one just being hidden by the start of the, the pelvis. Sacral vertebrae, they have three, and those three sacral vertebrae are fused. So all these vertebrae in between, they have a little um, cartilaginous joint so that you allow movement throughout all of your vertebrae. Hence, cats can twist and dogs can jump and spin, uh, and we can do yoga. So between all these little verte uh, vertebrae and all these discs, or sorry, vertebrae, there are little discs of cartilage between each that allow for movement. The sacrum is different, however, and it's fused together as one solid bone. Caudal or coccygeal vertebrae, they have 5 to 20, depending on what breed of animal, uh, dog they are or cat and whether they've had their tails docked or not. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the cervical on the horse, we have 7 again. So it goes from the starts just after the foramen magnum of the skull and carries on down to the scapula. And then they have 18th thoracic, which ends just almost by the last rib. They have five to six uh, lumbar and five sacral, which again are fused. And then their coccygeal varies again depending on whether or not their tails have been docked or depending on the type of horse or pony it is. And we carry on with the cow. And here you can see the sacral vertebrae are fused as opposed to the joints in between each of the other vertebrae. What's the purpose of knowing and numbering this, the vertebral column of an animal? What would the purpose of that be? That's something to think about for class. Okay, now your spinal processes. So the vertebrae, as noted before, are separated by intervertebral discs made of fibrocartilage on the outside and gel on the inside. So these little discs, which can cause a lot of disease if those discs get thin and the bone touches together, they have a fibrous fibrocartilage outside and a squishy gel on the inside to allow for movement. The spinal cord runs down the middle, the center of the vertebrae, through the vertebral foramen. Again, foramen is the hole in the bone. And the atlas and the axis are unique to ensure appropriate support of the cranium. So we'll talk about those little guys in a minute. It's good to know the anatomy of the vertebrae in general and what we're talking about by the different processes. So this is the anatomy of the thoracic and lumbar vertebrae. So we have the dorsal spinous process, which is most pronounced on the thoracic vertebrae. If we go back, thoracic vertebrae, the dorsal spinous process is most noticeable on the thoracic vertebrae. The articular process is the one just off to the side, so sort of the dorsal lateral aspect. C is the accessory process, which varies depending on which vertebrae we're looking at. D is the transverse process, which is most predominant in the lumbar vertebrae, which we won't be able to see until we get to class. Okay, so that's a good indicator of two different types of vertebrae. Thoracic vertebrae has a long dorsal spinal, spinal process. Lumbar vertebrae have long transverse processes. And again, this, the dorsal spinous process, the length in the thorax is to allow attachment of the muscles, the uh, rib muscles, the muscles that surround the ribs, to allow for inhalation and exhalation. 
and the transverse, the lateral process in the lumbar, attach all those lower back muscles and all the abdominal muscles to the animal's body. Okay, breaking down the cervical spine, so looking at our cervical spine, we have two that are unique, and then the rest follow a similar pattern. So our very first cervical vertebrae, so C1, is called the atlas, and it looks like a butterfly. Its unique shape allows cradling and support of the skull. And then the axis is C2, so cervical vertebrae 2, and it allows a great connection with the atlas, and it allows back and forth movement of the skull. The rest of the cervical vertebrae more or less look like that. Okay, fairly concise, no unique processes. Definitely know these two and know the differences and their purpose. So looking at an x-ray, which we'll look at a lot of in lab, we have C1, which is also the atlas, C2, which is the axis. So you can see with the axis, you've got that overhanging almost like um, an axe, <laughs> kind of. C3, 4, five, six, and then seven, you can see it's just under the scapula. This bone here is the start of the scapula. Our thoracic spine, so our thoracic vertebrae, uh, this one starts halfway through. So we have T6, T7, T8, T9, etc. And these ribs are connected to a joint these ribs have an articulation, so they create a joint with the thoracic spine to stay in place. Okay, so your thoracic spine, just remember which process on those vertebrae is most predominant. Dorsal spinal process, it's dorsal spinous process. Lumbar, um, just to note here, so this is a picture of the lumbar spine, or lumbar vertebrae. This here is the sacrum. Okay, the sacrum is the next one that we'll talk about, and it's shifted upwards. So if you count backwards, it would be L7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, and 1 for your lumbar vertebrae. Okay, so the sacral and coccygeal. This is your sacral, so it starts that upward shift from the pelvis. And then your coccygeal are the, the tail vertebrae. And this is your sacrum. I have a couple of sacrums that we'll talk about in class. So it's fused. On the cow, we've got five different vertebrae that create the sacrum. So one, two, three, four, five, and they're fused together as a plate for protection. Okay, ribs. So your ribs, there's this picture, I believe, page 173 to 174 in your Colville text. Know the function of the ribs and the components of the ribs. So looking at this picture, this is a ventral view of the ribs. So what we're looking at is uh, the blue is actually cartilage and the white is the ribs. So this structure here is not the spine, but rather it's the, stern the sternum. Um, so looking at each rib, each rib has a portion made of cartilage which connects to the sternum and a portion made of bone which creates an articulation, so a joint, with the spine, with each uh, spinal process. The area in which the cartilage and the bone meet, this area here, is called the costochondral junction. Definitely know that. And rib pairs, so if we look at this, I just want to make sure. So when we're talking about cats and dogs, we're looking at 13 ribs, 13 pairs of ribs. So looking at this, this would be a cat or a dog. Rib pairs 1 to 9 directly attached to the sternum with the cartilage. So rib 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, and 9 are attached to the sternum. Uh, with their cartilage. 10, 11, 12 are attached to rib 9 and that's called the chondral arch, or sorry, the costral arch. 
And rib number 13 is also called the floating rib because it actually has a little bit of cartilage and then it doesn't attach to any portion of the, the sternum or any other rib itself. And we can palpate that in dogs and cats and you can actually see it in dogs and cats when they're emaciated or quite thin. Clinical applications, you can definitely look into this. There are all sorts of reasons that we count ribs. It's really important to be able to count ribs and think about what are some physical factors that can make it quite difficult to count ribs on the animals. Okay, our sternum. Our sternum is made up of eight sternebrae. So when we're talking about the sternum, that word refers to this whole apparatus. When we're talking to each one of these little component parts, those are called sternebrae. So the most cranial aspect of the sternum is called the manubrium. Manubrium sticks in your head. And the most caudal aspect of the sternum is the xiphoid, or the xiphoid process. Good clinical applications, and we'll go over this a little in class too. The manubrium creates a junction between the ribs and the start of the shoulders um, to create the thoracic inlet, is what it's called. So when we're taking blood from dogs, cats, and horses, we often landmark the manubrium, so you'll feel for the manubrium, and then shift to the left or right to hold pressure um, to, to fill that vein up with blood so that we can visualize and take blood from that vein. So it's a really good clinical application. The xiphoid, the clinical application, when we start talking about muscles, it'll make more sense. But the xiphoid attaches to the linea alba. So the linea alba is the white line that, of connective tissue that runs from the xiphoid down to the pubis symphysis in the pelvis. And it holds all the abdominal muscles together. It's the true midline of the animal. All right, that was a long explanation of the axial skeleton, but I hope it makes sense. So we'll move on to the appendicular skeleton. So in our appendicular skeleton, we've got our front limbs and our hind limbs. So our front limbs include the scapula, humerus, radius, ulna, carpus, metacarpal bones, and phalanges and definitely know the differences in this aspect of the skeleton between canine, um, feline should be the same as canine, but between canine, bovine, and equine, because they differ. Okay, so here is our skeleton, and this is truly what you'll need to know. So have a look. So our scapula is our shoulder blade, and it has this crevice in the middle, which it allows for muscle attachment. That is called the spine of the scapula. Our pelvis is broken up into different parts, so we'll talk about that in detail. Femur is the long bone of, or a long bone of the hind leg, and it's the longest bone in the body. Patella, that's our little sesamoid bone, our kneecap. Tibia is the bigger bone of the distal limb. Fibula is the supporting bone behind the, fib, the tibia. And then we get down into our tarsus, which is our ankle joint on these animals, and our metatarsals, which are sort of the, if we look at the bridges of our own feet, where we have the top of our foot and we have all those bones, if somebody steps on the top of your foot, it hurts like heck. Those are your metatarsal bones. So likewise, animals have them too. They're your metatarsal bones. And then we get our phalanges, which would be our toes. Now this process here is the same as our heel, if we compare it to humans. So this is called the calcaneum or the calcaneus. I call it the calcaneus. The common term to call it is a hock, H-O-C-K. But for anatomy, definitely call it the calcaneus, but do know that it's also called a hock. That's our distal, or sorry, that's our hind limb. Moving up to our front limb, we have our humerus, which is a nice long bone. We have our olecranon process. I'll talk about that in a second. We have our radius and our ulna. Now the ulna comes up and the point of the ulna is the elbow. 
which is also the, the point is called the olecranon process. So do know that as well. Know the olecranon process. Looking at our radius, if we look, if we place our hands on the table and look at our forearms, our radius comes down to meet in the medial aspect of our wrist and it works its way up towards the lateral aspect just before our elbow. So we'll talk about that in class as well because it crisscrosses over the ulna to create better support. Carpals, that's our wrist. Remember, drive the car with our hands, so it's up in the wrist. Metacarpals, when you wiggle your fingers, you see all those long bones in your hand move above your fingers. Those are your metacarpals. And within that, um, well, the, the joint between your metacarpals and the start of your phalanges would be the knuckles, so the metacarpal joints, and then the phalanges, which are the toes. Same with the horse. It's very similar. The difference is that um, the radius and ulna are fused, so they aren't two separate bones. Because of the amount of support that they need to run and trot, they are actually fused, the radius and ulna. Still note that they're there when you're filling out your uh, diagrams, but also note that they're fused. Very, very important. The metacarpal bones are also fused. So we have a metacarpal bone and then a splint bone, it's also called. Likewise with the back, the metatarsal bone is also called the cannon bone. And then the splint bone um, is the metatarsal bone as well but they are fused. And I'll talk about those in a little bit a little bit more. Another difference with the horse, and this goes uh, the same with the cow, is that the tibia and the fibula are also fused. Again, they're not two separate bones. We still make note that they're two uh, separate components, but they are fused together. And then of course, looking down at the horse's foot, rather than toes, they have one toe. So their phalanges, the little bones of their fingers, actually create one finger. So horses are always uh, <laughs> standing on one toe. So if you go to look at page 180 in Colville, uh, yeah, in Colville, you'll get a good representative image, which is coming up in this slide, of the ancestral horse and the current horse and how their distal limbs compare. Because over time, uh, you know, horses went from more of a dog-like animal, so the theory goes, started losing their toes, changing their anatomy, and we start to sh see that shift in toes uh, because they have one toe in the end on each hoof, and their metacarpal bones, rather than being independent bones with independent movement, they fuse together for greater support. So this is our canine and feline front left paw. We are looking at the dorsal aspect, so put your left hand on the table, and that's what we're looking at. So the top of your left hand, this would be the top of the left foot, of the, the front foot of a dog or cat. What you'll need to be able to do is label this image, and it looks really confusing, but it's all repetition. So we'll go through it. What we're looking at here, we have the bones of the carpus, so the bones of the wrist. You don't need to know all those bones, okay? Just that they are their carpal, their carpal bones is fine. Overall, looking at this foot, we have one, two, three, four, five digits, and we start counting from medial to lateral. So again, looking back at your hand, we're starting to count from the le uh, your thumb out towards your pinky. So we would call that digit one is like your thumb, and then digit two is like your pointer finger. Digit three would be the middle, digit four is the ring finger, and digit five is the pinky finger. Most dogs and cats, most of them, do not have digit one on their hind feet. So what we would do, looking at a hind foot that doesn't have digit one, we would just start counting two, three, four, five. Okay, we continue the count. All right, so looking at the various bones within these digits, 
We have the longest bones in the feet are the metacarpal bones. So that's like the feet, uh, or sorry, that's like the bones on the bridge of our foot, so the top of our foot, or the top of our hands when we wiggle our fingers. So looking at this, metacarpal bone one, metacarpal bone two, three, four, five. So we have our metacarpal bones, one of each, and then we start working down to the phalanges. So the phalanges on most toes, there are three phalanges, and the singular form of the term phalanges is phalanx, and I'll go over spelling in class, but it's, yeah, okay, it's right there, it's phalanx. So looking at dig, uh, digit one, that is normally the dew claw. It is always the dew claw of the animal. So something that we know about the dew claw is that it's way up there on the foot. It looks a lot shorter than the other fingers, the other toes. And that's because it has a shorter metacarpal bone and it's missing its middle, phalang its middle phalanx. So to label this one, our dew claw, which is digit one, we have proximal phalanx and it's distal phalanx. And the distal phalanx is where the toe, uh, sorry, the toenail is. Digit two, we have our metacarpal bone, and then we have our proximal phalanx, our middle phalanx, and our distal. And that carries on with the last three digits. Okay, so proximal phalanges, middle phalanges, and then distal phalanges. In between each, you have sesamoid bones. Don't worry too much about those, just note that they are sesamoid bones. Okay, so do get to know this. I find it really helpful, and I think it's in an activity to just color the various portions in different colors to help label them. So this is that uh, antiquated, well not antiquated, but the um, ancestral horse so looking at the ancestral horse, it's kind of cool uh, because at one point they had more than one active metacarpal bones, which led to phalanges. So they had, uh, sorry, more, not more than one phalanx, but they had more than one digit. So they actually had three digits in the past, which over time have combined just into that middle digit to create the current equine distal limb skeleton. So looking at this one, so that's their metacarpal bones, which are fused. And then you have your proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx where the hoof would grow. So horses are always walking on one tippy toe, one finger. Okay, and then we have our bovine. So this is, again, they have that fused metacarpal bone. And then they have their sesamoid bones, they have proximal phalanx, middle phalanx, and distal phalanx. And they are bicloved, so meaning that they have two, two cloves to the hoof, two portions, um, two fingers basically within one hoof. Okay, so moving on, we're going to talk about our pelvis a little bit. Uh, the, Anatomy of the pelvis, this is a really good one too, to just color in and get to know. So interesting, not interesting, it is interesting. Everything to do with anatomy is interesting. So this is our pelvis overall, and it's made up of different portions of bone. So we have our ilium, which starts from about halfway through the hip socket. So this is the hip socket. So your ilium starts at about there, and is the entire... Um, dorsal portion of the pelvis. Specifically on the ilium you have the wing of the ilium which is really great for landmarking when we're giving lumbar injections. Okay we'll talk about that in class but really important for landmarking lumbar uh, intramuscular injections. So you have your ilium, you have your ischium which is about again halfway down that hip socket and through to the uh, ischial, the ischial tuberos, sorry, ischial tuberosities and down. So that's your ilium. And then in the middle you have your pubic, pubis. Okay. 
Okay. Now, interesting points about the pelvis. So we talked about the wing of the ilium and its clinical application, which is so important. The hip sockets, that is called the acetabulum. And that is where the femoral head pops into the hip and allows for nice, smooth movement. The femoral head is nice and round and smooth. There's lots of lubrication within that joint and the acetabulum, it sits happily and allows for movement. Obturator foramen, or foramen, however you want to say it, that is the foramen of the pelvis. So as with most foramen, it doesn't, typically there's nothing, there's no bone that passes through it or connects to it, but rather nerve endings and blood vessels pass through it. So that's generally the purpose. If you ever see a foramen on a, a skull or any portion of bone, it's allowed to allow for blood vessels and nerves and tissues to pass through, but it doesn't connect to another bone. Another purpose of the obturator foramen is to allow less weight to the bone because the pelvis is quite significantly heavy and it's a big composition of bone. It allows for less weight uh, without changing the structure or the function. The ischial tuberosities we can talk about in class on really skinny dogs and cats. You'll find it under the tail just before the legs start and you can actually see it or feel it. Okay, that's a nice little breakdown. Excuse me. Uh, yep. Okay, we'll talk a little bit about our canine fem femur anatomy, really important parts to it. So, uh, as with most long, long bones, they have, the, well, with all long bones, with all bones in general, they have a proximal end and a distal end. Proximal meaning that this is the part closer to the body, this is the part further away from the body. Remember when I was talking about that acetabulum in the pelvis, that nice little hip socket? This is the femoral head, which connects into the acetabulum. Oops. Okay, connects right into that hip socket and it's nice and smooth and rounded. The opposite side, so looking at this bone, this is the left femur of a dog because that would connect into the left acetabulum. The greater trochanter is the process opposite to the femoral head which allows muscle and ligament attachment. This area is considered the neck of the femur, the shaft of the femur, um, the trochlea is down here. Don't worry too much about the trochlea. We have the lateral epicondyle, and epicondyle is referring to the outer edge, the outer process on the distal portion of the bone, and the medial condyle. And again, those condyles and around that trochlea allow for attachment of those ligaments and muscles to connect with the tibia. Okay, looking at the caudal aspect of this bone, so the other side, uh, it's the same, but we, and it's just, uh, yep, it's just a better example of how far that medial and lateral condyle extend. Okay, so processes, meaning projections, areas that stick out on bones to allow for muscle, tendon, attachment, etc. So here's our tibia fibula. Um, and this is the, we're looking at the cranial aspect of this bone. Okay, so we have our patella, which is just their little sesamoid bone. It's not actually part of the tibia fibula. We have the head of the fibula. And the fibula runs behind and to the medial aspect of the tibia. Okay, you have the shaft of the tibia, the shaft of the fibula. The tibial crest is really important, and you can't really see it on this image, but we'll see it in class. And the tibial crest allows for a lot of muscle attachment. If somebody kicks you in the shin <laughs> and it hurts and bruises, they're probably t kicking you in the tibial crest, okay? And that allows for all those shin muscles to attach. We have the medial malleus and the lateral malleus. I'm sorry, the fibula runs on the lateral aspect of the tibia. I think I said the opposite. So the medial malleus and lateral malleus malleolus, sorry, again allow for muscle attachment. And this is just another image of the actual feet of a dog and a cat. So these are the hind feet, A because it's telling us tarsal, but B we're missing digit number one.
Equine distal limb. We'll talk about that in class. Um, something to note on this one though. So the distal limb, the cannon bone is the tibia and the splint bone is the fibula. And the splint bone is actually the, or sorry, I got that all wrong. The cannon bone is a metatarsal bone and the splint bone are the second and the fourth metatarsal bones fused. And the tibia and fibula are fused to create the cannon bone and the splint bones. We'll talk about this more <laughs> in lab. Okay, so moving on to joints. Goals for joints, joints of the body that is. So know the common terms for the various joints. Identify the commonly utilized joints on equine, bovine, and canine species. And classify the joints into one of the three types. So what are our three types of joints? We have fibrous, cartilaginous, and synovial. Anytime, by the way, when you're reading the text or when you're reading references, if it's talking about arthro, it's talking about joints. So arthroscopic surgery or an arthroscope, anything like that, it's going into the joint. All right, so our fibrous joints, they do not allow for movement. They are very firm fibrous tissue that unites two areas. And the example would be the joints that unite the flat bones in the skull. Cartilaginous joints allow for slight movement. Slight rocking movement is permitted. And the examples would be the joints between the vertebrae and the spine and the mandibular symphysis joint. Synovial are freely movable joints. And a good example is the stifle, the carpus, the tarsus, the shoulder, etc. We have lots of synovial joints. Three characteristics of synovial joints. It's an articular surface that's present on the surface of the bone. So there's a joint surface on top of the bone. Cartilage is present on that articular surface. And there's a presence of a fluid-filled cavity called a joint capsule. So looking at this, we have, this is our joint capsule, okay? We have articular cartilage that surrounds the, the uh, end of the bone, sorry, the articular surface of the bone. So we have articular cartilage. This surface of the bone itself is called the articular surface. That's the epiphyseal uh, bone, so also the growth plate would be there. And then we have a ligament that surrounds the outside of the joint, the tendon, etc. So the articular surface, um, it's the very, very smooth surface of the bone itself. So it's just the shaded area here. The bone rubs against the bone to form a joint. They're made of a smooth layer of compact bone over top of that cancellous bones. The articular cartilage, which is here, are th it's made of thin sheets of hyaline cartilage on top of that articular surface of the bone, and it acts like Teflon, allowing the two portions of the bone to slip past each other without rubbing or cracking. The joint capsule, so this is the joint capsule in general, it contains a fluid and that's called synovial fluid, and it acts to protect the joint. Um, it acts to as an anti-inflammatory for the joint, and it helps lubricate the joint as well. Okay, so ligaments versus tendons. Now you'll find a lot of this will be back and forth and ligaments and tendons sometimes are used interchangeably. Technically, um, there is a, a difference between the both, or the two, sorry. So ligaments are and tendons are both thick bands of connective tissue. Ligaments generally join bones to other bones. Tendons join bone to muscle. 
Okay, so an example here. Uh, we have just one sec. Okay, so looking at the stifle joint. So this is the beautiful stifle joint. So you have the tibia. This is the tibial crest on the cranial aspect of the tibia. This is the fibula coming up behind. That's the flabella, and it's a sesamoid bone behind the knee, patella. And this is the, the condyles, so the distal aspect of the femur. Okay, so this makes up the stifle joint, which is the knee joint. Looking at the stifle joint, if we break it down to look at the various ligaments, we have the patellar ligament, which holds that patella in place over the femur, and it allows it to slide back and forth. Okay, then we have the bone, would be the femur, tibia, fibula. If we pull back our patella and the patellar ligament, we have all sorts of ligaments within the stifle. It's pretty amazing. So we have the medial collateral ligament, the caudal cruciate ligament, which is on the back side of the knee. The lateral meniscus is um, it's saw, it's uh, connective tissue filled with a gel-like fluid, and it acts as a cushion between the two bones. And then, uh, so you have your lateral and your medial meniscus, and then most importantly within the stifle is this cranial cruciate ligament. In people, it's called the anterior cruciate ligament, ACL, cranial cruciate ligament, and most, or not most, it's one of the most common injuries to the, the hind limb is a cruciate ligament injury. So take example A, this is my dog, Leia, She's a great Pyrenees, and she's had everything under the sun wrong with her. So she blew her cruciate. She had to go on steroids for quite some time. She blew her cruciate because of the steroids and because she's a big dog. Had surgery, um, and that's life. <laughs> it looks worse than it is. But anyway, six months later, she blew her other cruciate, so she had a second surgery, and now she's just fine. So the surgery we did was the tibial plateau leveling osteotomy, so TPLO, where they actually change the angle of the tibial plateau, which is the top of the tibia, insert a plate and some screws to make sure it doesn't come apart, and she's now bionic. She can run marathons. And the surgery, as you can see, didn't stop her from being a bad dog. Okay, uh, just a little quiz for yourself. Just to look at this, so this is an image that I took with a cell phone of a computer screen, so it looks kind of crummy. Here's our anatomy. We have our lumbar vertebrae, so C or L76543. We have our pelvis, okay, that's our ischial tuberosity, wings of the ilium. Our sacrum is through here. You can see it's tilted up. Then you have your coccygeal vertebrae. Femur, head of the femur. Patella labella, tibia, fibula. Okay, so this is distal, distal limb. Now look at this image. Have a good look at it and come to class and let me know if you think that is normal. If not, what's wrong? Okay, so then finish your worksheets if you can. And there's some resources for anatomy. Um, now the other thing I just wanted to show you was in regard to the foramen magnum going way back to the skull um, they can have the another condition caused uh, sorry in horses and dogs and it's oh where am I at sorry it's called wobbler's disease and it's sort of a crushing of the spinal cord within the cervical vertebrae so I just wanted to show you a quick video about what wobbler's disease looks like it basically makes them look like they're a little bit drunk, so they start to lose balance and they're unable to control their footing. So if you look at this horse, not quite sure where it's walking, having a hard time staying put, that's called wobbler's disease. Happens to horses, uh, Dobermans are a big one for dogs, and any large breed dog can definitely get wobblers. And it's sort of a crushing of the spinal cord in the cervical vertebrae. And that's called a. I'm running on battery power. Uh, it's called ataxia when they walk like that, and they're all wobbly. Okay, that's it.